Hello guys and welcome to the second set of video notes here for the spring semester. Um, today we're going to be talking about a couple of different things actually. Kinetic energy, the work kinetic energy theorem, and then gravitational and elastic potential energy. A couple of these terms might already be familiar to you guys. Probably you talked about this a little bit in eighth grade. But we're going to go into it in more depth today and then you guys will have some practice problems to do with it on Friday. So the first thing we're going to discuss is kinetic energy. And you guys might already know that energy, um, kinetic energy is energy in motion. So anytime an object moves, it's going to have kinetic energy. Kinetic energy depends on the object's mass and on the object's velocity. The faster it goes and the larger it is, the more kinetic energy it has. Now kinetic energy is a form of energy that we measure in joules. All energy is measured in joules. are the units for kinetic energy. Now let's do a quick example problem here and let's say we have a 5 kilogram ball and it's moving at a velocity of 2 meters per second. Let's try to make this a little easy for the start. So let's say I asked what is the ball's kinetic energy? Well we would do 1 half mass times the object's velocity squared and we should get 2 times 2 is 4, times 5 is 20, times a half is 10 joules for your kinetic energy. Now, let's say I wanted to make that ball travel 2 times as fast. So now, my, the ball speed is going to be 4 meters per second. What would be its kinetic energy? Now, if you guys remember, we talked about relationships between uh, variables and what happens when you square something. Um, when you double the speed of something because of this squared sign here, effectively you're going to be quadrupling the object's kinetic energy. So this becomes 1 half m 4 v squared instead of just v squared. So that should mean that our new kinetic energy is going to be 40 joules. You can do the math to figure it out or you can just understand the relationship between the velocity and that squared sign. Now, um, if I wanted to triple the velocity, let's say I wanted to make it be going 6 meters per second, same situation, now the kinetic energy would be 9 times as much. So the velocity here, changing your velocity is going to result in a larger change in your kinetic energy than if you were just to simply change the mass. All right. And we talked about work the other day. Work and kinetic energy are related by something called the work kinetic energy theorem. Now remember me telling you guys how uh, work is a form of energy transfer. So if I'm going to do work on an object, I'm going to either increase or maybe sometimes decrease that object's energy. A lot of the time it's going to change the object's kinetic energy. Remember that work is equal to force times distance, so if I apply a force to something, it's going to accelerate. That acceleration is going to cause a change in velocity, which is going to cause a change in kinetic energy. So, to write this in equation form, we're going to say that the work done on something is equal to that object's change in kinetic energy. Here we have work net, or total work, equals change in kinetic. Remember that whenever we have this change sign, we're going to take the final kinetic energy and subtract it from the object's initial kinetic energy. So whenever we use this theorem, we need to take into account all of the forces acting on the object and figure out the total net work. An object could be experiencing many different forces. If this is our object, we could have a force to the left or to the right, maybe one to the left. We could have forces at angles. But when we use our work kinetic energy theorem, what we're looking at is the total net work, not the work done by individual forces. So if the object's speed increases, the work done on it is positive, which we can tell from our equation. If the total work equals mvf minus one half mvi squared. If your vf is larger, that means it's speeding up, which means that your work is positive. 
On the other hand, same thing applies. If this is smaller than your initial, the object is slowing down and the work done on it is negative. So here's an example, um, and let's work through this one together. You guys are always welcome to pause the video and try to do these on your own before you see my solution. Um, I really think that's a, a good way to try to learn this stuff, um, is trial and error. So Imani is wearing frictionless inline skates on a surface, and she's pushed by a friend with a constant force of 45 newtons. How far must she be pushed, starting from rest, so that her final kinetic energy is 352 joules? So, let's take a look at what we know. We know our force in this problem is 45 newtons. We need to figure out our distance. We know that we want our final kinetic energy to be 352 joules. Now you guys might be like, I don't really know what her mass is, I don't know how fast she's going. None of that's really important because they've already told you the final kinetic energy. So, remember that work is equal to change in kinetic. So that means work is force times distance. And we've got a final kinetic energy minus an initial kinetic energy. Now, Monty's starting from rest, so that means that her initial kinetic energy is just going to be zero. So her force times distance should equal her final, which is 352. We know our force is 45, so from there it's pretty easy, because all we have to do is divide 352 by 45. That's everything I just did. So, we get a final answer of 7.8 meters. Okay, this one I do want you guys to try on your own. Um, I'm going to give you, I'll go, you can pause it now and uh, try to give it a shot. But this is about a textbook sliding across a table and it's going to come to rest after traveling 1.2 meters. And it gives us a coefficient of kinetic friction of 0.34. So, um, in this case, I gave you guys a hint. The force of friction is the net force on the object because the object is sliding to a rest. So, we have a mass of 0.75, a coefficient of 0.34, and a distance of 1.2 meters. And we know we're going to use our work kinetic energy theorem to figure out our problem. So work is force times distance. Kinetic energy, remember, 1 half mv squared f minus 1 half mv squared i. Now the book is coming to a rest, so what does that mean for our kinetic energy final? That means our kinetic energy final is zero. So what we have is force times distance equals our initial kinetic energy. You can leave that negative in there if you would like. So if this is our book, our force of friction is going this way. We have normal and gravity, but they cancel out. So our coefficient here is equal to the force of friction divided by the normal. And I told you in my hint that the force of friction is going to be your net force here. So we have 0.34. Our normal force is going to be 7.5 times 10, or 0.75 times 10. Is our relationship. So if we do 0.34 times 7.5, we get our force of friction to be 2.55 newtons. So it looks like we have everything in our problem now except for our initial speed. We have our force, we have our distance, and we have the mass of our book. So 2.55, 1 1.2, half 0.75 times our initial speed squared. 
So when we do 2.55 times 1.2, we get 3.06. This is 0.375, and this is v squared. Now don't forget, at the end of all this, to take the square root of your velocity. You should end up with a speed of 2.85 meters per second. And this is all the work I just did. 2.82, 2.85 is fine. Okay, so now we're going to talk about potential energy. Um, and just to kind of recap, uh, just understand that the work kinetic energy theorem relates your kinetic energy or your energy in motion to the work done on the object, which when you think about it makes sense. If I'm going to apply a force to an object, the object is going to change its speed. Consequently, if it changes its speed, it changes its kinetic energy. All right, so on to the potential energy. Potential energy is any kind of stored energy. We're going to talk about gravitational and elastic, two completely different kinds of potential energy. Um, they are both considered to be energies of position. So where the object is is going to determine how much gravitational potential energy they have and how much elastic potential energy they have. Gravitational potential energy. You kind of have to think about how much potential does gravity have to do work on the object. And that's going to depend on how high the object is from a particular reference point. Most of the time, we pick the reference point to be the ground. Not always, and I'm going to show you guys an example of how you can kind of move that around. But the gravitational potential energy is most of the time measured at a zero level, which is the ground. But gravitational potential energy is equal to the mass of the object times gravity, acceleration, which is 10, times the height. How high is the object up off the ground? Heavier you are, the taller you are, or how high, higher up off the ground you are, the more gravitational potential energy you will have. The more potential gravity has to do work on you. So let's look at an example problem, kind of sketch something out real fast. Um, just to give you guys an idea. So uh, let's say we're going to slide down a hill. And let's say this hill has a height of 12 meters. And let's say this down here has a height of 0 meters at the bottom. This is us. What, and let's say, we have a mass of 50. What is our gravitational, oh sorry about that, potential energy at this point? Let's call this point A and let's call this point B. What is our gravitational potential energy with respect to point B? Well, considering that this is point B, we're 12 meters above that. So our gravitational potential energy then would be 50 times gravity times 12. What would be our gravitational potential energy with respect to point A? Well, we're sitting on point A here, so our height above here is zero. So our gravitational potential energy with respect to point A is zero. Let's say we pick a new point, and let's say this point is right here exactly in the middle. We'll call this point C. And we'll say the height from here to C is 6 meters. So now, what is our gravitational potential energy with respect to point C? Well, now we're just concerned with how high up off the ground we are from point C, which in this case appears to be 6 meters. So our gravitational potential energy would be 50 times 10 times 6. Gravitational potential energy is pretty easy and straightforward. Um, so let's move on to our elastic potential. 
Elastic potential energy is the potential energy in a stretched or compressed object. A lot of the times we talk about in physics springs or um, elastic rubber bands, strings, anything that is stretched or compressed has elastic potential energy. And the amount of energy that it has depends on the distance that the spring is compressed or stretched. Uh, bungee cords are a really good example of this. If you stretch that bungee cord out really, really far, it has a lot of potential energy stored in those pieces of elastic. When you release it, it's going to want to fly back together super, super fast. That's the release of all of that energy. So elastic potential energy is defined using this equation. Elastic potential equals one-half times k times x squared. The elastic potential, um, this k right here, sorry, that's something we call the spring constant. And this x represents the amount that the spring is compressed or stretched. So let's talk a little bit more about the spring constant. The more stiff the spring is, the higher the spring constant will be. Now every spring has a spring constant or a value assigned to it. It's just a descriptor that we can use to um, describe the stiffness of the spring itself. And it's measured in newtons divided by meters. So let's do this example problem. Um, a man is attached to a bungee cord with a relaxed unstretched length of 15. The spring constant is 71.8 jumps off a bridge and when he finally stops, the cord has a stretched length of 44 meters. What is the elastic potential energy of the bungee cord? So, here's our bridge, here's our dude, and our spring, or I'm sorry, our bungee cord here, unstretched, is 15 meters. Now, eh, when he bungee jumps, the x distance, or it, it totally stretches to 44 meters. The x for our spring is going to be the difference between 44 and 15. This is going to be 29 meters, I'm sorry, yes, 29 meters. This is the distance that the spring is stretched. You can't use 15 because that's um, the length of the bungee cord at equilibrium. And you can't use 44 because that's not really how far we're stretching the bungee cord. We're actually pulling it an extra 29 meters. So, our spring constant from the previous slide was 71. 71.5 times 29 squared. And that'll tell us how much elastic potential energy is stored in our spring. And you should get a pretty large number, about 30,000. All right, guys, that is all I have today. And um, if you guys have any questions, feel free to email me. And uh, I will see you guys on Monday.